New Thinking Aloud is presented by the California Institute for Human Science, Mind Body Spirit University, a leader in fully accredited in person and online U.S. college degree programs in the topics we cover here. Visit their website at cihs.edu. Thinking Aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to examine what it means philosophically to conduct empirical research on the question of survival after death. With me is Dr. Stephen Browdy, who is an emeritus professor of philosophy and former chairman of the philosophy department at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. He is the author of many books on parapsychology, including Limits of Influence, The Gold Leaf Lady, Crimes of Reason, and Immortal Remains. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you, Jeff. Good to be with you. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. You know, uh, some years ago, I attended a seminar with uh, Raymond Moody, who has a philosophical background. Right. And we were looking at the question of life after death, and he had a very unusual perspective. He said it's nonsense. And in order to understand what the afterlife is all about, you have to appreciate nonsense. And so he had a whole set of exercises on all the levels of nonsense. And he felt that uh, by coming to terms and understanding all the subtleties and degrees of nonsense, one could begin to appreciate and even prove to oneself the existence of the afterlife. Uh, very different from an empirical approach, I think. Yes, I'm not sure I understand why he said it's nonsense, but what, one thing I would certainly agree with is yeah. that there are various preliminaries, conceptual preliminaries, yeah. that need to be gotten out of the way before we can even begin to dig into the details of particular cases. And that's what we're going to do. Uh, in this interview. Let's talk about those preliminaries. I think he meant it was nonsense because it's somehow completely separate. The afterlife is apart from the world of the senses. So, in that, in, in that sense, it's nonsense. Okay, I can get that. Yeah. But the preliminaries that we need to consider are, first of all, just what kind of question are we asking? Yeah. I mean, it's one thing to consider whether there's evidence suggesting life of some kind after death. And it's another thing to ask whether there's scientifically respectable evidence Mm -hmm. or whether a scientifically respectable case can be made for saying that at least some people survived the death and dissolution of their body. Is it even possible to uh, establish life after death scientifically? And if so, what would be the requirements? Well, one requirement, first of all, is to get clear on what we're talking about. Some people talk about life after death as if When we die, our consciousness gets absorbed into a grand soup of consciousness, Mm -hmm. a kind of merging with the infinite. Right. That's not what we're talking about. That kind of post-mortem existence would obliterate whatever is distinctive psychologically about us. Mm -hmm. Um, That might count as a kind of life after death, but it's not the sort of personal survival that has interested parapsychologists or most people. When people wonder about whether they're going to survive death, what they really want to know is whether they will persist in some way that uh, preserves whatever is distinctive psychologically about them. They want to know whether they will be able to uh, continue to interact with or peer in on their relatives and loved ones, um, whether they will be able to exact revenge on people who harmed them during their earthly existence, or whether they'll enjoy an existence after death in which they just get their hair back. (laughs) <laughs> so, that kind of survival yeah. requires understanding what it means to exist in a later state as the same person as you were before. Right. So, there's a sense in which the whole topic of survival of bodily death involves the concept of what it means to be the same person. The, the very notion of identity is crucial. Right. Identity, well, there's a cluster of concepts. Identity, personhood, um, 
And those are probably the two primary mm -hmm. ones we need to worry about. I know Frederick Myers in his classic book referred to human personality and That's its right. survival. And the reason he did that, I think, is because what most people are concerned about re-identifying from the evidence from mediumship, for example, is whether there's something psychologically continuous uh, post-mortem with what we know of the people before they died. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and one of the questions that has been raised by philosophers looking at this is, is it even uh, logical to talk about human identity in the absence of a physical body. Right. Some people have claimed that the notion of personal identity hinges on a prior notion of bodily continuity. Mm -hmm. um, I have several things to say about that. One is that that's just, well, here's another preliminary we should probably mention. Yeah. Um, there are two kinds of questions about survival of bodily death. There's the metaphysical question about what it means to say that someone has survived the death of his or her body. Mm -hmm. And the other is an empirical question. How do we go about or how would we go about identifying someone post-mortem with a pre-mortem individual? Mm -hmm. The metaphysical question, the one that philosophers know and love, I think probably comes second in the order of things. Right. Because we have many ways of re-identifying people. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand, first of all, how difficult it might be from a philosopher's point of view to answer the metaphysical question when we consider what makes the chronologically and follically challenged Stephen Browdy today the same person as the infant who appeared on the scene many years before. Mm -hmm. um, lots of things have changed. My body has changed in many ways. I've lost lots of cells in the meantime. Bodily s skin cells fall off all the time. Right. We've lost an enormous number of brain cells every day, which, by the way, is one of those discoveries of modern science that doesn't exactly contribute to human happiness. So, all sorts of physiological changes, all sorts of psychological mm -hmm. changes have taken place between Browdy as an infant and Browdy now. What makes Steve Browdy now the same as the infant? That's a very difficult philosophical question. And usually when philosophers answer it, they answer it by supposing that there is a privileged concept of identity mm. which or personhood which we need to invoke in cases like this. Well, obviously there's the legal identity. There's legal identity. Yeah. If you look at multiple personality, there are all sorts of criteria for identity. Mm -hmm. I mean, the psychological criteria are what come into play when we wonder whether we should give um, different alter personalities different gifts at Christmas or mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. But physical continuity is what matters when we consider whether the various alters deserve different driver's licenses or social mm -hmm. security cards. I mean, from a legal point of view, that, that's pretty much been settled. As, as far as I know. It has to do with bodily continuity, but there actually are some interesting legal cases yeah. that have to do with uh, chemical, chemically induced personality changes mm -hmm. or um, other major personal psychological conversion experiences mm -hmm. where we might want to say it's a different person. Yeah. But I think what we need to notice, first of all, is that there are various ways in which we go about identifying people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we rely on a combination of uh, physical and psychological continuity. But sometimes we identify people by email or on the phone. Mm -hmm. um, we don't see their body, so we have no bodily criteria we can appeal to. We recognize them as the same person in virtue of how they behave. And other times we might recognize bodily continuity but see no psychologically distinctive behavior. Mm -hmm. But I think what interests us mostly in cases of postmortem survival is whether the distinctive and hopefully uh, valuable features of a personality have survived the death and dissolution of the body. Well, yes, typically you, one assumes that there's some form of communication going on uh, <laughs> through a medium, often uh, a trance medium, a spiritualist medium. And the question is, how do we uh, ascertain that that communication constitutes a surviving personality. We would do it presumably the way Ducasse described, the philosopher C.J. Ducasse described in an analogy. He said it's a little bit like what would happen if you think your friend George had died in a plane crash 
and then you get a phone call from someone claiming to be George. Mm -hmm. How would you determine that it was really George on the other end of the phone? You can't see the body making the phone call, so you have to rely on something else. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, what you rely on will be perfectly satisfactory. If the person on the other end of the phone behaves in idiosyncratically George-ish sorts of ways, yeah. um, mentions things that only George would be in a privileged position to know, in particular things that had to do between George and the person on the other end of the phone. Mm -hmm. You might have sufficient basis for saying, yes, it really is George, despite what I thought about George not being able to survive the plane crash. So, what you're saying is it can't just be one thing. If, if, if it's George's personality, that might not be enough. Or if it's information that uh, the voice of George provides that turns out to be accurate, that might not be enough. It needs to be several converging uh, lines of evidence. Well, the more the better, obviously. Yeah. So, the more verifiable information George can give, which only George would be in a privileged position to know, and which nobody else could know by normal means, that would be very persuasive. If George's personality or distinctive abilities is somehow manifested also, mm -hmm. that would be uh, icing on the cake. In, in other words, to get back to the argument about the there can't be identity uh, in the absence of a physical body, you, you discount that argument. Well, I think the philosophical issues are interesting and important, but um, real life concerns trump philosophical metaphysics every day. Yeah. And I think even a metaphysician, if confronted with a slam dunk case suggesting survival, would put metaphysical scruples aside and say, mm -hmm. here, we've got a case suggesting yeah. the persistence of somebody after bodily death. But, but minimally speaking, there needs to be some form of communication. Yes. or. Um, some other kind of evidence suggesting the persistence of a unique character mm -hmm. in a situation in which it shouldn't be normally uh, expected. Mm -hmm. One could point, I suppose, to all of these supposed psychic photographs where spirit images appear in, in the photograph uh, as evidence of survival, but I don't think those photographs are ever brought up as evidence for survival. No, what we need are two things. First of all, we, some living person needs to exhibit either knowledge or abilities that are uniquely or idiosyncratically associated with the deceased person. Mm -hmm. And then some reason to think that um, the knowledge couldn't have been gained by normal means or the abilities developed through normal channels. And, and that's particularly difficult when one considers uh, here we are in Las Vegas, a city known for its impersonators uh, who are very good. Uh, you know, it's quite possible for one person to impersonate another. That's why it's important to have verifiable information which only the deceased would be in a position to know. Mm -hmm. So, if a medium tells you, I'm in touch with your Uncle Harry, and Harry is telling me that there was a secret will in his in a secret compartment in his desk, and nobody living knows normally at any rate about mm -hmm. that particular item. And then we find out later that, in fact, there was a secret compartment yeah. in the desk and a secret will, and there is a case like that. Yeah. Um, that would be at least helpful in d deciding that it was really Harry who persisted. It, it would be helpful, but the obvious counter explanation is that the information was acquired through some form of clairvoyance. Well. All right, let's back up for a second. Yeah. So, let's consider how we might, in principle, explain mediumistic evidence for mm -hmm. survival. The way I look at it is that first, there are several lines of attack. First, we can consider whether what I call the usual suspects mm -hmm. explains that. The appeal to the usual suspects would be an appeal to uh, fraud, malobservation, misremembering, something like mm -hmm. that. The very best cases are not explainable by appeal to the usual suspects. Right. So, we want to talk about the better cases. Those in are the other words, the usual sub suspects are conventional, non-paranormal explanations. Yes. And, and probably off the top of my head, I would say that might account for as much as 50% of reported cases, maybe much higher. I wouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. I don't have figures, but yeah. uh, certainly many of them. So, the parapsychologists are interested in cases to begin with that pass that filter that the exactly. usual suspects are not capable of explaining the phenomenon observed. That leaves what I would call the unusual suspects. Yeah. 
And there things get a little more interesting because an appeal to the unusual suspects would be an appeal to abnormal processes like um, prodigious memory or dissociative creativity or something akin to the kinds of manifestations of abilities we see with uh, savants or prodigies. Mm -hmm. or, well, and then another really tricky area is the idea that maybe portions of a personality survive, memory traces might survive, uh, but not a whole intact personality. Well, let's, let's set that aside for the moment because right. um, you're absolutely right, of course. Uh, if we had evidence, the question is, uh, is it evidence that everybody survives or that just some people survive or survive in a half-assed way or survive just for a little time? Mm -hmm. um, but those are things we can worry about after we've got some evidence that we say is really evidence of some kind of survival, whether it's partial or total. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got the unusual suspects right. as potential uh, ways of explaining away the evidence. Again, I would say the very best cases can't be accounted for in terms of appeal to the unusual suspects. Mm -hmm. But that leaves one more unusual suspect, which is the most recalcitrant of all, and that is what some people, I think, unfortunately call the super psi hypothesis, which Michael Suddeth, I think, correctly says we should call the living agent psi mm -hmm. hypothesis. And let me just say for a moment why I don't like the, the term super psi. Okay. Even though it's very well entrenched in the literature at this yes, point. Yes, it is. Um, one thing is that we don't have any kind of, it's, it's needlessly normative, evaluative. We don't have any kind of, easily agreeable mm -hmm. uh, scale of how super psi has to be to count as super, mm -hmm. what super for one person may not be for another. But the implication of people who use the term uh, is that this is a, a degree of uh, clarity and a degree of accuracy uh, that exceeds what is normally observed, for example, in the parapsychology laboratory. Uh, that's right. But let me just back up for one second again. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing I don't like about the term super psi is that it's prejudicial in another way. I mean, when people use the term super psi, they use the word super in the way in which we would associate it with the term superhero mm -hmm. rather than super glue. Yeah. I mean, we have no trouble understanding the use of super in the term super glue. That just means really great glue. Yeah. Okay? Um, but when people use the term super psi, they use it as if the degree of psi involved is antecedently incredible. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think living agent psi is a better term. Mm -hmm. But you're right. Um, the idea is that the amount of psi expected in these cases would transcend what we observe in experiments. Mm -hmm. Now, actually, I agree that it might indeed be be a degree of psychic functioning that does transcend what we see in experiments. But most human behavior transcends what we see in the behavioral science experiments. Sure. So I wouldn't make too much of that. Yeah. And, and occasionally, uh, even in uh, card guessing experiments, you get the subject who will guess 26 cards in a row. Well, not only that, mm -hmm. but if you look at the good remote viewing evidence, some mm -hmm. of our best remote viewers do fantastic feats of uh, clairvoyance. Yes, absolutely. 100% accurate and great detail. Right. It, it uh, does occur. Based on almost nothing to go on, like mm -hmm. geographical coordinates presented as binary numbers. Mm -hmm. So, faced with that kind of prodigious ESP ability, I think we need to be very cautious about assuming uh, that the amount of super psi required for living agent psi explanations is incredible. Right. Besides, Ironically, survivalists, that is those who believe in post-mortem survival, are committed to virtually the same amount of psychic functioning for their explanations. So the question then, the real heart of it, especially for parapsychologists and psychical researchers, is, is what are the philosophical requirements that would enable us to distinguish between a super psi explanation and a survivalist explanation? I, living agent psi explanations. <laughs> yeah. It's really hard to know. And uh -huh. it, some people would say, and I'm very sympathetic to this, that it's almost impossible to decide conclusively yeah. one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean nothing can count against either explanation. But may I raise another preliminary? Sure. Um, one of the main problems with the literature on survival is that people arguing in favor of survival are trying to get away with a little bit of logical sleight of hand. Mm -hmm. And they do that by 
pointing out how the living agent psi hypothesis requires making various assumptions about um, dissociative creativity or um, needs among the living mm -hmm. um, that would cause them to do things that simulate the evidence for right. survival. Survivalists would say, by contrast, the survival hypothesis offers very clear predictions about what the evidence should look like. Mm -hmm. That's the sleight of hand. A simple survival hypothesis, as again Michael Suddeth has been pointing out, yields no predictions whatsoever. Mm -hmm. It doesn't tell us anything about why the evidence takes the form that it does. To do that, survivalists also need to bulk up the survival hypothesis with lots of auxiliary assumptions, which are independently not verifiable, mm -hmm. about how easy it would be to communicate, whether the deceased would even want to communicate, whether um, there's noise in the channel, and so on. Well, if, if one were, let us say, a spiritualist, a Kardecian spiritualist, one might have... Uh, many, many books, practically an encyclopedia full of descriptions of uh, what the afterlife is supposed to be like and, and uh, assumptions uh, from which one could form hypotheses. Well, I think you've got to be wary about yeah. that. There's a very famous story, or I think it's famous, about F.W.H. Myers. Mm -hmm. um, before Myers died, he made a distinction between telepathy and telergy. Yes. Telepathy was just mind-to-mind -mind interaction. Telergy was a kind of possession where he thought the deceased would take possession of the medium's um, body and vocal organs mm -hmm. and so on and produce a trance impersonation. And he hypothesized that um, the most adept spiritist communicators would preferred to communicate by telegy rather than telepathy uh -huh. because it produced a more robust kind of right. uh, impersonation. Mm -hmm. Now, after Myers died, there were all sorts of post-mortem ostensible Myers communications. I understand they're still ongoing. Yes. But what's interesting is that the post-mortem Myers changed his opinion about mm -hmm. this. And he said, actually, the best communicators would prefer to communicate by telepathy rather than telegy, mm -hmm. and that telegy by comparison was a creaking, clumsy process. I, I, well, that's an interesting uh, observation, I guess. Well, it is, but it shows, as Bro C.D. Broad said, it seems that we die and learn. Mm -hmm. So, but I think the moral for us is that um, we need to be very circumspect about what auxiliary hypotheses we attach to the mere claim that people can survive bodily death. Whether they would want to communicate by telegy, by telepathy, whether it's easy to communicate, whether they would have the will to communicate, the mental acuity to communicate, and so on. Well, especially because we have very little understanding about what an afterlife is and, and what it ought to be like. Well, we don't understand what it ought to be like, but we know what the evidence is. We mm -hmm. know that the evidence for mediumship is uh, quite varied. That along with nuggets of good information, verifiable information, there's a lot of twaddle, as the British Almost would say. Almost invariably, and even in the very best of cases. Yes, and often the communicators seem to be in a kind of dreamy or dreamlike state, mm -hmm. as if they're not fully with it. Mm -hmm. So, it leads to natural speculation about what happens in the trauma of dying. Does it do something to our mental acuity? Do we really get all our faculties back? Mm -hmm. Do we get our hair back? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? I am not holding up any high hopes <laughs> no, for no, hair no, restoration. No, either. But it does seem to me that um, it's, it's, we're at such an early stage of this research. It's been going on for 150 years, and one might think that that's a long time. But given the enormity of the problem, I can well imagine that a thousand years from now, many of the philosophical issues that you're raising today will still be valid. If only we could have a real slam dunk, near ideal case mm -hmm. suggesting survival. One for which living age and psi explanations just seem automatically ruled out. I mean, I think there are things to be said about all this. What kind of um, additional evidence we would need. One thing I, I, I want to go back to, if I may. Yes. Why survivalists are committed to the same degree of psychic functioning as the uh, proponent of living agent psi. Mm -hmm. So, may I give an example? Yes. Suppose a medium says, your Uncle Harry's with me and um, he's glad to know that you're happy about your new job. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, if that's not living agent psi, 
the survivalist has to appeal to some ESP between the medium and Uncle Harry to know what Uncle Harry's thinking. Right. And Uncle Harry needs to use some ESP to know what I'm feeling. Right. Or if Uncle Harry, the deceased Uncle Harry says, uh, he likes the new necktie I'm wearing. Mm -hmm. Question is, how does Uncle Harry know what I'm wearing? It requires some clairvoyance of the current state of the world to be able to report that. And again, mm -hmm. the medium needs to be able to interact telepathically mm -hmm. with uh, mm -hmm. Uncle Harry. In, in other words, what you're, <coughs> you're saying is that for the survivalists who don't like the living agent psi hypothesis, the problem for them is that uh, living agent psi is, or, or psi between the medium and the deceased, which would be equivalent to living agent psi, is, is also necessary for them. Or between the deceased and the world. Mm -hmm. So, I know you've conducted an interview on that famous chess case. Yes. Um, I would say that in that case, uh, although f there were 47 moves that need to be explained, it's difficult to explain for the survivalist just as, as it is for the proponent of living agent psi. Because the deceased chess player would need to know the state of play on 47 different occasions to know what the appropriate move is, mm -hmm. and then to be able to communicate that to the medium mm -hmm. uh, on 47 different mm -hmm. occasions. Mm -hmm. That's an awful lot of sigh. Mm -hmm. Well, th so there's no getting around uh, the necessity for sigh. Even a, right. a spiritualist medium uh, <coughs> engaged in communication uh, un un until we understand that there might be some purely physical mechanism for that to take place, we have to assume it's some kind of clairvoyance. I think so. Yeah. I mean, what we mean by clairvoyance is awareness of some physically remote state of affairs without the mediation mm -hmm. of ordinary sensory organs. Yeah. And that applies to the deceased as well as to the living. Well, Stephen, our time is up already. It goes, right. it goes quickly. And I know we've just scratched the surface of some right. of the philosophical issues, but I think it's important for our viewers to realize uh, the necessity to think philosophically about this problem. All science rests on philosophical assumptions somewhere along the line. Thank you so much for being with me, Stephen. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you for being with us. Book 3 in the New Thinking Aloud Dialogue series is UFOs and UAP, Are We Really Alone? Now available on Amazon. You can now download a free PDF copy of Issue 7 of the New Thinking Aloud magazine or order a beautiful printed copy.